Hello there, and welcome to Period 8 of the AP U.S. History Study Guide on the Gilder Lehrman website. This discussion will cover a variety of important events in U.S. history between 1945 and 1980. Let's start with the first key concept for this period. The United States responded to an uncertain and unstable post-war world by asserting and attempting to defend a position of global leadership with far-reaching domestic and international consequences. Let's call this first theme, Positioning for Global Influence. In the time period directly following World War II, there came a time when superpowers began to roam the Earth. Just following World War II, the Soviet Union and the United States emerged as two international superpowers at opposite ends of a discussion about how Europe would be organized and run following the devastation of the war. The Marshall Plan was the United States' massive foray into the rehabilitation of the European continent. Billions of dollars were earmarked for anything from infrastructure repair to currency support to goats. But the world was finding itself increasingly divided along new lines drawn between allies of communist nations, or the Soviet Union, or those committed to democracy, the United States and its partners. So we have the development of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, which promoted a military alliance that was structured to support allies in need, and the Warsaw Pact, which was a similar alliance of nations, just for those on the communist side of the story. So where does this all go? How could these two superpowers get to the point of threatening each other with war? Step 1. Communism spreads its wings. The Soviet Union continued this push by establishing its satellite states throughout Eastern Europe. You could start thinking about this with the Berlin blockade, the Berlin airlift, establishment of the East German communist state. With this growth, the US government turned towards a new foreign policy and a new, more fearful kind of domestic discussion was beginning. Our second step, the US proclaims a global policy of containment. George Kennan's paper on containment dictated much of U.S. foreign policy for the years of the Cold War. Containment policy simply stated that the United States would, through a variety of means, stop the spread of communism dead in its tracks. This pledge was also known as the Truman Doctrine. Later, the Eisenhower Doctrine outlined a U.S. policy in the Middle East that assured United States support in an instance of impending threat of invasion, attack, or incursion by international communist forces. Our third step was the Chinese Communist Revolution in 1949. It would not help the U.S. Soviet relations as another large, powerful nation transitions to communism and the anti-communist craze in the United States would just get even worse. The advent of atomic weapons propagated the notion of mutually assured destruction. Instead of peace, calm, and prosperity, Americans were fearful, on edge, and pushing human and economic resources into the growing conflict with the Soviet Union and its offshoot nations in different parts of the world. Enter Joseph McCarthy. This junior congressman took a growing role, and eventually the role, in helping safeguard the American people from the growing threat of communism within the borders of the United States. This campaign, based on heavy fear-mongering, convened congressional committees, the House on american Activities Committee, that targeted Americans from the average Joe to the politician, and ultimately, high-ranking military officers and Pentagon officials, which ultimately led to McCarthy's undoing. This hunt for traitors within not only propagated feelings of fear among average Americans, but pushed them to feel suspect of each other, and movements for political change, like civil rights. The successful launching and orbit of a Soviet satellite that sparked the race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union showed Americans that they were no longer in the driver's seat of global technology, most importantly weapons or defense technology. There was a massive government investment in the industries needed to keep and grow national defense. Before he left office, President Eisenhower warned about this trend, naming it a military-industrial complex. As time progressed, the U.S. would enter into a series of police action-like wars that were directly linked to the ongoing U.S. Cold War with the Soviet Union. This part of the story starts with the Korean conflict between 1950 and 1953. North Korea, supported by communist nations China and the Soviet Union, invaded its southern counterpart, which was supported by a United Nations force headed up by the United States. After three years, the war was essentially a draw, leaving the peninsula divided to this day along the 38th parallel. Then in the mid-1950s, a revolution in Cuba, led by Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, resulted in the expulsion of all U.S. business interests and the exile of dictator Fungelicio Batista. The advent of a new communist nation only 90 miles from a U.S. coastline pushed the nation towards what would become the most intense, almost war of the era. Once Fidel Castro took total control and accepted the alliance and support of the Soviet Union, President Kennedy sent in a group of Cuban exiles, trained by the CIA, to execute what would be known as the Bay of Pigs invasion. To say the least, this mission failed. Next, in 1963, the whole odyssey of the Cuban Missile Crisis unfolded. Cuba had set up Soviet missile installations that could be seen by satellite, pointed at major U.S. cities, and refused to A, acknowledge their existence, and B, would not take them down. The U.S. and Soviet navies were mobilized, a blockade was established, and Kennedy and Khrushchev swooped in at the final moment to avert what certainly would have been a serious global calamity. 
The Vietnam War would begin with a small group of American advisors showing up in the late 1940s and continue with massive American commitment of troops and resources between 1964 and 1977. In over a decade of involvement, the U.S. engaged in campaigns that included jungle warfare, the use of napalm, to covert actions and carpet bombing in Cambodia. A peace process led to U.S. troops being withdrawn when it seemed that all possibility of a U.S. victory was lost. And then we have the Americans back home. We see a very real divide in American society with regards to an intervention in another nation. This was a war that people did not understand where American soldiers were being killed in record numbers. To find out more about the international relations at home and abroad, check out Physicists Predict a Nuclear Arms Race from 1945, Harry Truman Responds to McCarthy in 1950, John F. Kennedy's Inaugural Address from 1961, and Robert F. Kennedy on Vietnam in 1967. This now brings us to our second key concept. A new tide of liberalism, based on anti-communism abroad and a firm belief in the efficacy of governmental and especially federal power to achieve social goals at home, reached its apex in the mid-1960s and generated a variety of political and cultural responses. To simplify, we'll call this one Equal Rights for All. In 1954, with the landmark decision of Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, schools were, by law, required to desegregate campuses and classrooms. The uproar from the Southern establishment was large, and parents vowed to never allow their kids to attend integrated schools. Protests against segregation and racist public policy resulted in powerful actions like the 1955-56 Montgomery bus boycott. The boycott not only showed the power of collective action, but it made it to the front page of national newspapers and forced people to, at the least, be aware of the issues involved in this battle for civil rights in America. The next year, nine African American students put Little Rock, Arkansas on the map after the Arkansas governor used the National Guard to keep the kids out of school to ensure some kind of real transition to the integrated schools in the American South. Let's also not forget that this year also gave the nation its first wide-spanning Civil Rights Act of 1957. John F. Kennedy, the second youngest elected president, narrowly beat Richard Nixon in a hotly contested election in 1960. Following Alabama Governor George Wallace's denial of the integration of the University of Alabama, Kennedy federalized the Alabama National Guard in order to ensure this transition. In 1963, over 100,000 people marched on Washington in order to bring national attention to the issues that drove the civil rights movement. Though Kennedy believed in the issues, quietly supported Martin Luther King Jr., he did not speak at the rally from fear of congressional retribution. After Kennedy's assassination, Lyndon Johnson and his administration took the reins of a nation about to explode with fury and angst regarding both the passing of a popular president and the rapid escalation of the civil rights movement. Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which made illegal the discrimination against any individual based on race, creed, culture, or ethnicity. 1965 brought the nation more mass collective action on the civil rights front, with the Selma Freedom March, where national civil rights organizations like the NAACP, SNCC, and the SCLC came together with ordinary Americans to push for stronger, more lasting legislation. This was an effort validated with the U.S. Congress ratification of the Voting Rights Act in March of 1965. The assassination of leader Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968 didn't stop the civil rights movement in its tracks, but gave the nation a moment of pause as it mourned the loss of a man who gave his life for the simple notion of equality for all people protected under the law of the United States. In the late 1960s, the assassinations of King, Malcolm X, and other leaders, and the growing tension in urban areas led some to black separatist movements like the Black Panthers. The group aimed to provide social services within the black community. The Panthers also fought against police brutality in African American neighborhoods and the right to protect themselves with guns on their own streets. So shifting gears a bit, we'll move into the 1970s and the presidency of Richard Milhouse Nixon. Richard Nixon inherited involvement in Vietnam from Johnson, got busted for covert wartime practices by the release of the Pentagon Papers by New York Times reporters, engaged in the first successful diplomatic efforts with China since Mao and the Communist Revolution, only to leave office in disgrace with his central, but not direct, involvement in the Watergate scandal. With the resignation of the Commander-in-Chief, Nixon's VP, Gerald Ford, was now in a peculiar position. Ford inherited and governed a nation experiencing the worst economic downturn since the 1930s, a nation still licking its very fresh wounds from the Vietnam War, and, towards the close of his extraordinarily short presidency, pardoned his predecessor of all wrongdoing with regards to the Watergate scandal. Jimmy Carter's one term was witness to the gas crisis and stagflation, but also to the historic Camp David Accords and the SALT II treaties. He was a man for making peace. Now we come to the final key concept of period 8 of the AP U.S. History exam, U.S. culture and its emerging counter. 
For many Americans, there was a real sense of normalcy in the immediate post-war years, with a new kind of affluence and the rise of a strong American middle class. But in the years after the war, American culture and society also underwent a manic round of changes. Between World War II and the close of the 70s, starched khakis, loafers, and Oxford shirts were exchanged for torn Levi's, leather fringed vests, and a sexual revolution. Automobiles became necessary parts of people's lives. With the Federal Highway Act of 1956, Americans with cars now had access to the suburbs and cities and the farms, all connected by an interstate highway. Immigration also increases at this time, and America finds a new kind of ethnic and cultural diversity. With the Immigration Act of 1965, America's doors opened again for a new generation of immigrants. The Hart Seller Act allowed for expanded immigration from the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. Immigrant populations from the Caribbean and Latin America also grew in numbers following the passage of this legislation. Environmental concerns also become a reality and an extremely important conversation. In 1962, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring showed the nation that household items, including chemicals like DDT, caused great environmental harm to both land and animals. American legislators were convinced that polluted air was not the way to go and passed the Clean Air Act of 1970, which placed regulations on emissions and set a variety of standards by which corporations would base their operations. This was followed promptly by the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency and two years later, the Clean Water Act of 1972. Youth and young adult culture in the United States rapidly changed as the conservative values of the 1940s and 50s gave way to the sex, drugs, and rock and roll laden 1960s and 70s. Young people had learned lessons about pushing for change from the civil rights movement. The anti-war movement, exemplified in Students for a Democratic Society, drew on an educated middle and upper class student seeking universal change in society. They rebelled against a government they saw making decisions that would have lasting impact on their lives without their involvement. Women's rights also became a hotbed issue during the 1960s and 70s. Betty Friedan wrote The Feminine Mystique, Congress passes the Equal Pay Act, an Equal Rights Amendment was approved in Congress, Title IX paved the way for female athletes all over the nation, and Roe v. Wade brought the issues of both abortion and privacy to the forefront of a newly emerging American conversation. Finally, we have the beginnings of a growing gay rights movement that was marked by violent instances like the Stonewall Riots in New York City's West Village in 1969 and the assassination of San Francisco City Council and Harvey Milk in 1978. So as we come to the close of period eight of the AP U.S. History exam, we have a couple of things to consider. Number one. The United States emerged from World War II as a global superpower, willing to flex its muscles to protect its economic and political ideals and those of its allies around the world. Number two, a Cold War enveloped the world as the United States and Soviet Union played out their differences on a variety of battlefields. Three, the civil rights movement, at its height in the 1960s, afforded basic equal rights for all Americans, regardless of color, race, or creed. Number four, with all of this, U.S. mass culture experienced a facelift, where post-war affluence meets a new, anti-establishment kind of counterculture. Check out the following on the Gilder Lehrman website to learn more. Ronald Reagan on the unrest of college campuses in 1967, the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963, Don't Buy a Ford Ever Again from 1960, President Ford's statement on pardoning Richard Nixon in 1974, and in that same year, President Ford's remarks in Japan. And then we have the 1980s. But you're going to have to wait for that one for the final AP U.S. History Study Guide video to hear about the glorious decade that will round out our review-style discussion of the history you need for the AP U.S. History exam. But for now, Go to the study guide on the Gilder Lehrman website for more information and tips on mastering this material and building your skills for the test itself. Hey there, I'm back here with Tim Bailey, Education Director of the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. We're going to go over the fourth and final historical thinking skill you'll need to get really good at before you sit for the AP U.S. History exam. Hey, Tim. Hi, David. How are you doing? Good. Good. So I'm looking at the last one here and that uh, the College Board has here on their historical thinking skills. And skill four, historical interpretation and synthesis. So I was hoping you could help me out. Historical thinking involves the ability to describe, analyze, evaluate, and create diverse interpretations of the past, as revealed through primary and secondary historical sources by analyzing evidence, reasoning, context, points of view, and frames of reference. Okay, so here's the deal. People will look at the past through their own lens. Let's look at the Cuban Missile Crisis as an example. The U.S. saw Soviet missile installations in Cuba only 90 miles from Florida and pointing at major U.S. cities. They believed this to be a distinct threat, but the Soviets were pretty fine with this. The Soviets viewed the U.S. missile installations in Turkey as an equal threat to the one in Cuba, but the U.S. was certainly fine with that. So, the big idea here is that interpretation of historical events plays a very large role in one's understanding and use of history while navigating different parts of the AP U.S. History exam. 
All right, so the next one they have here is synthesis. So this is how they describe it. Historical thinking also involves the ability to arrive at meaningful and persuasive understanding of the past by applying all the other historical skills, by drawing appropriately on ideas from different fields of inquiry or disciplines, and by creatively fusing disparate, relevant, and perhaps contradictory evidence from primary sources and secondary sources. Additionally, synthesis may involve applying insights about the past to other historical contexts or circumstances, including the present. Okay, so here, you need to pull together all available information, even mathematical and scientific data, to arrive at a new or unique understanding of said historical topic. This will likely allow you to not only discuss historical issues with more specificity, but will show how you can connect that history with relevant contemporary issues. Here's a good example. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring illuminated a great deal about the negative environmental and health impacts of chemical use in different parts of American society. Mm -hmm. You could very well pair that information with current environmental data to support a discussion of the connection between Carson's original work and today's impacted environmental issues in the United States. All right.